This episode of the MJ Cast is brought to you by Crack Corn, the ridiculously delicious ultra premium puff corn. Not popcorn, puff corn. Buttery, sugary, salty, and sweet, you've got to try it. Head on over to crackcorn.com slash the MJ Cast for an amazing deal just for our listeners. And they ship right to your door. It tastes amazing. And they're proud to be our very first ever sponsor. Show Crack Corn some love. Crackcorn.com slash the MJ Cast. The following is a presentation from the MJ Cast, the internet's premier podcast on all things Michael Jackson. I'm a black American. I am proud of who I am. Together, we can make a change in the world. I want to see you! <laughs> I like to take sounds and put them on the microscope. There's a driving bass, you become the bass. Let the music write itself. I don't sing it if I don't mean it. (laughs) Welcome to the MJ Cast, your source of news, discussion, and interviews on the King of Pop. Hello, and welcome to the MJ Cast. I'm your host, Jamin Bull, and I can't believe we are kicking off our sixth season. Today, I'm thrilled to interview one of the most important artistic collaborators in Michael Jackson's career, and certainly one of the most important collaborators in terms of his live performances. Kevin Dorsey is someone who absolutely deserves to be recognized as a key element in Michael's success as a live musician. He started out as a backup vocalist for Michael on his Bad World tour and eventually ended up becoming Michael's vocal director and assistant musical director for a range of his solo tours. Not only has Kevin worked with Michael Jackson, but he's also worked with Whitney Houston, Quincy Jones, Toto, Paul McCartney, Aretha Franklin, and many, many more. Dorsey has also been involved in film production, working with people such as Hans Zimmer and on films such as The Matrix and The Lion King. We can't wait to delve into Kevin's story and to capture his unique insight into Michael's career. Kevin, welcome to the MJ cast. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to be here. We're thrilled to have you. It's always a pleasure to talk with somebody who worked closely with the King of Pop. And of course, our co-host Elise Capron recently heard you speak at Brad Sundberg's in the studio with MJ. Yes, yes, that was fun. I I happened to be in Phoenix at the time, so I unfortunately couldn't be there live in LA. So I ended up doing it uh, via Skype and, and we still had a great time. Uh, it's fantastic. The audience definitely gave great, great reviews of your talk. And where are you normally based out of? I'm normally based out of Los Angeles. Uh, I do live here, and uh, and I've been here, my God, for almost 35 years now. I'm originally from Akron, Ohio. Okay, and I can hear the, the wonderful sounds of the L.A. landscape around you there. You're out and about today? I'm out and about, and I'm hoping that my headphones will cancel out a whole heck of a lot of any noise that you may be getting. (laughs) Well, I can hear you loud and clear anyway, so it'll be fine. Okay, great. And it's my understanding as well that you've been a very busy man lately uh, with The Lion King. Yes, you know, I'm fortunate to be one of five who did the original Lion King back in 94. And uh, this is the 25th anniversary of The Lion King, and I've had the, the pleasure uh, to work on all four of them, as a matter of fact. And uh, this one was very, very special because of the usage of CG and the live animals. I mean, everyone was quite, you know, just couldn't wait for this one to come out, and uh, it was well worth the wait. I mean, the music was wonderful, the cinematography was amazing, and uh, I had a great time once again working with Hans and Le Beau and some of the greatest vocalists in the industry, you know, doing this job. And we even used a choir from uh, South Africa this time, you know. So we used that choir and then we used uh, two choirs here in L.A. And it really made the, the sound along with the orchestration just fantastic. Incredible. And, and talk to us about your involvement in, in The Lion King. What's your specific role? My specific role in that uh, is vocally, whether it be arranging. I mean, the score is all Hans. And he had three other guys 
who jumped in on that. It was just great. I was, like I said, just happy to be a part of doing it once again and didn't get to do any incidental voices on this one, but it was still great and a lot of work. It's always interesting when you have to perform, you know, in a different dialect and in a different language. And uh, Le Boheme, who did the first one with us, is always great when it comes to, to him, you know, coming up with all of the different words that we need to use to really add that extra oomph, you know, to the realization of uh, feeling like you're there in, in Africa, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And I know many of our listeners at the MJ cast have already seen and, and loved the new Lion King. And uh, I regularly watch the original one with my with my daughter, my two-year-old daughter, Olivia. And uh, <laughs> we're big Disney fans. So <laughs> that's great to chat to you about. Right. <laughs> Um, what we love doing at the MJ cast as well is going way back to our uh, guests' origins and wh- how they sort of entered into the industry. Can you start by talking to us about your childhood, Kevin, and sort of where you grew up? I grew up actually in Akron, Ohio. Most people now are familiar with Akron, Ohio, because it's the hometown of NBA basketball star LeBron James. I grew up there and, my goodness, started began playing my first instrument at seven and taking lessons at seven. And my first instrument was the guitar. Then I did the bass, the drums, the trumpet, cornet, French horn, baritone, tuba, and last but not least, the piano. So, um, you know, played a lot of sport there at home and... uh, You know, it's always funny when you, the thing that comes most natural and the easiest to you, which for me was music, you kind of just, ah, okay, I got that to fall back on. But at the time, I thought I wanted to play in the NFL and do all that kind of stuff like any any kid wants to do at that time. But uh, sooner or later, I, uh, you know, just got the chance to, get involved in a local band at home, a band called The Bitter End. And uh, back in those days, everyone had a local band. Myself, Philip Ingram from the group Switch, late James Ingram, he had a local group called Revelation Funk, Howard Hewitt. He had a local band there called Life, the late Vesta Williams. She had a band, I mean, the OJs, the Ohio Players, Kinsman Daz, which became known as the Daz Band. Everyone had groups back there. And uh, as it turned out, everyone said, you know, something one day we'd like to uh, live that life and get a record deal and head to Hollywood or head to New York and, and let the chips fall where they may. It took me a while before I realized that I ended up naturally uh, going to college and studying voice and I had a medical technology minor. I thought I would end up being a college professor somewhere. And uh, lo and behold, I ended up in Los Angeles. In the industry following your original dream. Uh, And what artists inspired you as a young musician and singer? Being from Akron, Ohio and growing up in the 60s and 70s as a kid, we had one radio station that played everything. So in essence, you could hear the Jackson Five, you could hear Aretha Franklin, and right after that, you'd hear The Doors, you'd hear Carly Simon, James Taylor, and then after that, you'd hear James Brown and people like that. So I grew up very, very well-rounded as far as my musical taste because the only time you'd ever hear something different would be you change to uh, the next station, which in my home was a station Whistler, which was country western. It took me a while to really grasp Motown and the Philly sound and all that. I mean, because I just thought everything was as much as I'd hear something from Motown, I'd hear Seals and Crofts or the Rolling Stones or Beatles, you know, so everything was just wonderful music to me. I love Stevie 
I loved uh, the J5. I loved Aretha. I loved Seals and Crofts. I loved Chicago. I mean, man, I I just love. I loved it all. <laughs> well, it certainly s- sounds as though you, you had a very well-rounded appreciation of music at the time, and that's something Michael yes. himself often talks about when he was growing up. He even he even says in interviews he used to love listening to country and western and all kinds of things when he was a kid. Yes, yes. I want to know about when you got to LA and you settled down there, what would you consider to have been your first big break in the recording or music industry? In 1983, I auditioned Quincy Jones. Quincy was putting together a new supergroup, and they said he had in excess of 7,000 people come from around the world to audition for this group that would consist of four people. After, you know, from them boiling it down to 2,600 and 1,700 and 500. Wow. Uh, they say I ended up being the first of the four chosen. And it was myself, Saida Garrett, Daryl Finnessy, and a guy named David Swanson. Our first gig together was a Sydney 48 directed film entitled Fast Forward, which was a film that came, I always say it came a, a little bit too late. Uh, it was a film about breakdancing and Breakin had already come out. So it was a wee bit late, but it had good music in it. It was a fun film to watch. It never did that much, but that was my first gig with Quincy, uh, Fast Forward. And my next job with him was a film entitled The Color Purple. Whoopi Goldberg, Danny Glover. Yeah. Wow. And that was, uh, that was my first big feature film directed by Steven Spielberg and scored by Quincy. Yeah, that was my first big film. After that, a film that won, it competed with The Color Purple for best film. Uh, I worked on a film entitled Out of Africa. My mom's favorite movie with Meryl Streep. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then from there, I think I went to, what was next? Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Wow. And and I have heard through the grapevine, actually, that you're responsible for the, the famous... Oh, yeah, <laughs> vocal in that, in that movie. <laughs> you know, and, and the, the thing of that is, originally that was done by a group out of Germany called Yellow. They did the song, and I was working on the film with composer Ira Newborn, and we had finished up, we were wrapping up for the day, and Ira came up to me and said, Kevin, Kevin, I need you to go in here and and say these words and I was tired and I was just like oh, come on really really can I do this on another time to come on no no let's do it do it do it so I went into the uh into the booth and I looked at the piece of paper and it it, ha- it said you know oh yeah the <laughs> sun beautiful beautiful more beautiful and laugh so I said oh yeah <laughs> and then the sun, beautiful, <laughs> more beautiful, <laughs> you know, and uh, it kind of stuck. Oh, man, I, I got goosebumps right now. <laughs> that's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's been, my God, it, when you say time flies, that was in 85. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. in 85, but I mean, it still holds true today, you know? Well, I'm a school teacher, and me and, and my my other teacher colleagues were, were sitting around in the staff room two days ago, literally talking about Ferris Bueller and how it's one of our favorite movies ever all these years later. So, wow, you have wow. really worked with the greats. Absolutely. Now, another favorite movie of mine, before we get into our MJ chat, I am a huge nerd. I love The Matrix. The Matrix is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, when I saw it, when it first came out in, I think it was 99, I just blew my world. I went back to the cinema five times to see it in a row. Wow. I got to know what your involvement was in The Matrix. You know, my involvement with that, I was actually on, it was on the choral side, the choral and orchestration. And that was fun. I did The Matrix and I did Matrix, uh, what is it? The Reloaded? Reloaded, Reloaded, yes. Yes, Reloaded. I, I only did two of them. Or did I do all three? I may have. 
You, know, you probably you did all three because two and three were shot back to back. I'm pretty sure, like as one movie. Yes. And yes, we have. Uh, man, it, when you have been blessed like I have to do so so many things. I mean, when you do the Matrix, I mean, and then I think I was coming off of Forrest Gump, and then I was coming off of Austin Powers, wow. and you know, coming off of this one and. And glory and Amistad and my God, when Harry met Sally and and Beauty and the Beast and the Little Mermaid and Hercules oh, and wow. just you know on and you know the Polar Express and the Grinch that stole Christmas. I mean, you kind of forget more. People say, "Oh my God, you did blah blah blah," and I said, "Oh, did I?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you, you literally, you, you kind of forget, but it's just, uh, it's just a wonderful thing. I mean, I, I love music and I love all the facets of it that it entails, you know? And so I never thought when I came here that I would ever do commercials or be, you know, working on film and television and all that. I, you know, it was just, Hey, let's do some records and, and go on the road and have some fun. But my goodness, to be able to do voiceovers and do work on the film side and, and the television side, I mean, it's just been just wonderful. And uh, they say I'm just getting better. So I'm, that makes me happy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, someone with your experience has so much to add to the industry. So it's it's brilliant. Let's have a change of gears. I want to talk a little bit about the King of Pop, Michael Jackson. Um, what yes. were your perceptions of Michael prior to working with him as you were growing up? You know, just wow, pretty much. You know, I'm, like any other fan at the time, I mean... My first two records, LPs, or really my first two were 45s, were I Was Made to Love Her by Stevie and I Want You Back by the Jackson Five. Mm -hmm. And two of the members of my local band in Ohio were actually distant cousins of the Jacksons. Wow. You know, but far be it from me to think that my trek through music from Akron to school in Atlanta to Quincy, I mean, would lead to me auditioning to perform with Michael. And uh, my first time meeting him was they called me in to do voiceover for he and his brother's tour, the Victory Tour. Right. They had an opening where they were doing this King Arthur thing where they were pulling the sword out of the rock and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I love it. anyway, I, my, my voice was the narrative in that. I knew I recognized your voice from the, okay, yes. that makes so much sense. I've got it now. Yes. Yeah. You know, all of the behold and all that yes. kind of stuff. Yeah. So that was my first experience working with Michael. And then the opportunity came, Daryl Finnessy, who uh, worked with me with Q, and we were in the, in the group together, called me because they had not found a foursome that Michael had approved as of yet. And they were just, he just said, man, come on, you got to help me make this work. And uh, so he called me in, and it was myself, uh, Daryl, Dorian Holly and Cheryl Crow, who had just moved to L.A. from a little town in Missouri called Kennett. And she was a, a school teacher, a music teacher. The four of us auditioned and found out that same night that we got the gig and um, were given a time when rehearsals were going to begin. And that started the amazing run with Michael. What was your mind frame like going into working with Michael Jackson? I mean, this guy was one of the most famous artists on the planet who had, Thriller had already become the biggest selling album of all time. What was your mind frame like? My mind frame was one of, you have to be the best to work with the best. 
You can't fall short. And I was so correct when I walked in with that mindset because Michael was nothing less than a perfectionist. I'll never forget, we worked and worked and worked and worked and finally we got to production rehearsal because we didn't see him prior to that. Uh, in just vocal rehearsal, we didn't see him because he was working with Lavelle and those guys. And when we finally got to the production rehearsals over at Hollywood Center, that's when I knew that I had, boy, had to be prepared because we went through that whole set and our show at that time was two hours and 26 minutes. And we got down to two hours and 24 minutes. And someone missed a lighting cue. He stopped. He said, uh, 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 can't have that. We can't have that. Let's go to the top. And, you know, everyone was real tired. So, but I mean, what can you say? The boss said, let's go to the top, mm. you know, and then we get a, we get a break. And so. I'm thinking, and I'm sure everyone else is thinking, you know, we're going to the top of a uh, man in the mirror and in this thing and get a break. Michael meant, he's, uh-uh, we're going to the top of the show. Oh, wow. And so the only break we had that particular evening was the guys on the crew, you know, reloading pyro, resetting lights and getting ready for the opening. And uh, it was uh, back to starting something and let's get it in. Let's go. Let's go. Wow. So wow. That, that, that told me just how serious he was. And plus, this was his very first solo tour. And so, I mean, the world was going to be watching. And, and I hate to skip around, but... I'll never forget, I mean, rehearsals were just grueling. I mean, the, 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 shows, the shows were just, I mean, hey, <laughs> it, so, so easy, if you will. I mean, because rehearsals had been so grueling, you did the show in your sleep. But I was getting interviewed in Paris. The guy, he said, you know something, if I have one thing to say about the show and yours and Michael's performance is it was too perfect. <laughs> and I said, well, that's your only complaint. He said, and, and, <laughs> and so he says, how do you do that? What kind of mindset do you have? I said, well, at home in the States, you hear there's a little phrase that's used called to air is human. And I said, every person on that stage and involved in that production for Michael, for two hours and 26 minutes, we tried to be as less human as possible. Mm. It was just amazing. That bad tour was just, just so crazy. I mean, my first huge pro tour, I am touring with the greatest who ever stepped on a stage, in my opinion. And just to, to, to do that and travel the world and... And it, it, it's funny, my only, if I have a regret about all the years of touring and everything else with Slim, it would have to be, I never got a chance to see a show. Mm. It would have been great to go out on that VIP, out there in the VIP section and sit down and, and, and watch that show just to actually see it. I mean, I never miss one show, so that opportunity never came and I'm glad it didn't. I mean, I, I say that in a facetious way, if you will, but uh, to the energy of the people is what drove us along with the energy of, of Mike. I mean, when, when the house lights go down and we take the stage and that first initial roar of the stadium and the fans comes at you, it's uh, like Cheryl is right next to me and can't hear what I'm saying. That's how loud it is. Wow. It, it would have just been absolutely awe-inspiring to see. But I, I do know what you mean. Like, you were, you were a part of the team performing. I mean, it would, it, it would have definitely been a totally different vibe to be in the crowd watching the, the finished production. 
we love talking to fans as well who were at these concerts. I was never lucky enough to see Michael Jackson live. I've seen a bazillion concerts on, you know, on yeah. recording. Yeah. But um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, I'm certainly jealous of anybody who did. But any anyone who I've spoken to who has seen a Michael Jackson concert in person talks about it as being just a, an experience like no other. Well, you know, when you're there on stage and, I mean, the fans genuinely and sincerely loved him so, so very much. I mean, you know, when you see people just fainting and and just spraying them with water so that because the with everyone crushed together, I mean, the body heat is just, they get, some people just get overwhelmed and they fall out and they have mm. to carry them out and things of this nature. And, you know, every night I got one chance to actually watch Mike and I, I, I never missed him, not once. And that was uh, when we do human nature and to watch him perform and, and watch him just be himself and command that stage and audience was amazing and I no matter what happened during a performance I never missed him doing that song yeah I mean everything else I I was a part of you know and well even in that sometimes I had to sound like a shaker usually Dorian would do that but uh that would be my only chance to really just watch him and I'd watch perfection Every night, fourth song in the set. That was that. That was it. Yeah. And the bad tour is probably, if I had to stack up all of Michael's solo tours against each other, I would say for me personally, it's grown to be my my go-to favorite tour. I wish um, the estate ha- would be able to release it in really high quality. We, we do have a version of it. It's unfortunately only a low quality version. But um, watching it in high definition at the start of the Moonwalker film, um, that Man in the Mirror performance is just like, there's nothing like it. Nothing. You know, and, and, I, and, and I, I, I don't mind saying this. It, it hurts that the estate does not do things for the public and mainly for the millions and millions of fans who loved and appreciated him so much. Like you said, I, I would love to see them release them all. Bad was special because it was the first. So, so much work went into that. I mean, not that so much work didn't go into the other, the other tours, but I mean, dangerous. I mean, we were canceling a lot of shows because I mean, Mike was ill at a lot of times and a lot of things were were going on they all went went great they all were amazing we had fun we had some amazing performances but there was just something about bad that everyone if you had to use a term i'd say just everyone bought into it that this was going to be the greatest tour of all time and everyone put their best foot forward from the performers to the crew. It was just amazing. It really and truly was. Great insights there, Kevin. Love your thoughts. Look, let's take a break so I can introduce something new to our listeners. You would have heard at the start of the show that we've been sponsored. And let me tell you about our first ever sponsor here at the MJ Cast. Elise and I couldn't be more excited about it. That's because it's a company started by one of our own, a member of the online MJ community and a big fan of our show. They're called Crack Corn. They make this ridiculously delicious ultra premium puff corn. And what's puff corn? Well, you're really just going to have to try it to find out. But let me tell you, this stuff is amazing. It's something totally new and unlike anything you've tried. In fact, it was just introduced a few months ago and it's already making major waves across the snacking community. I got some samples a few weeks ago and loved them. It's buttery, salty, sweet and delicious. It melts in your mouth with the most satisfying crunch. It's just incredible. 
pretty much everyone who tries it gets excited to share it because it gets a real reaction every single time. And I'm speaking from experience. You get three tubs of crack corn in the box it arrives in. And I took two of the tubs to a party I went to recently for my sister. And I put them down on the table at the party uh, and they were the snack everyone was talking about. As big fans of the MJ cast, Crack Corn wanted to do something extra special for our audience, for MJ fans. They've created Fan Packs. It's the best Crack Corn deal available anywhere, and it comes with a little special surprise just for our listeners who head over to crackcorn.com slash the MJ cast to try Crack Corn for the very first time. It's beautifully packaged and presented in what they call an Eco Lux gift box, very sharp. When it arrives, you open the box and you've got three tubs of crack corn carefully wrapped with that little MJ surprise in there for our listeners. And that's just the start. When you crack one of those tubs open and take your first mouthful, that's when you know you've found your new favorite snack. Whether you want some for watching a movie, some to take to a party, or maybe a gift for a loved one, crack corn's got you covered. The order page even has an option to get it delivered to a loved one's house as a surprise. Sure, flowers are great, but what about a yummy snack instead? These fabulous fan packs are shipped directly to your door or that of a friend who's about to experience crack corn for the very first time. And let me tell you, it really is a memorable experience. You're trying something totally new here, and honestly, it is delicious. These packs are gorgeous, delicious, and sure to impress. And to get one of these sets, you do not need a promo code at all. Crack Corn have already generously built in an MJ cast discount for MJ fam all around the world. Head over to crackcorn.com slash the MJ cast to try this unique small batch snack. I've got a feeling this is really going to blow up. This is your chance to be one of the very first to try it. So head over to crackcorn.com slash the MJ cast right now and snag one of those fan packs. If you love great snacks and you love the MJ cast and want to see our podcast continue to improve, head over there, grab some crack corn. Thank you, crack corn, for being the MJ cast's very first sponsor. Let's get back to some Kevin Dorsey. Let's talk a little bit more about Bad. I'd like to go through each tour. So you said that the rehearsal process, and we've heard this from many other collaborators with Michael, that the rehearsal process is the really grueling stage of the whole process. And it's almost like the actual shows are, you know, that's when you can relax and have a lot of fun, um, traveling around, that sort of thing. Talk to us a bit more about the rehearsals and how they went, Michael's vision for the show, all of that sort of thing. The rehearsals were grueling. We would usually go from 10 in the morning to as late as one in the morning. And I mean, it was just over and over and over. And whether it was something dealing with the lights, whether it was something dealing with the, what we called gags, where we were uh, on some tours we used Siegfried and Roy, the other tours, we used uh, David Copperfield. Because the production was so huge, I mean, you know, where I remember once we had the actual graveyard for Thriller, and then we had the skeletons, and then we had this and the, that. I mean, and everything, everything it was all about timing. And everything had to, like, if something didn't, you know, if a coffin didn't pop open so the dancers could come out on Thriller. I mean, uh, now they got to work out the coffins. And <laughs> so now, you know, and and then it's back to the top of Thriller. That's good. Okay, all right, that's great. Next thing you know, okay, Thriller's good. Yeah, top of the show. Let's do it. And you, because everything was about timing, it had to be right. So we went right back to the top got the thriller, thriller went smooth, and you keep going. Sound was very important. I mean, super important. And he, he nitpicked everything. The only thing I can ever say about that is his nitpicking made me a better performer, a better vocalist, eventually a better producer, and it made you appreciate what it takes 
to get to the top and stay there. That's a big thing. So, so many people get to the top, but how many can remain? It's a cliche when they say it's lonely at the top, but it is. It is. I mean, I'll always say that, that Mike was the most misunderstood person that I'd ever known in my life. You know, because people who didn't know him could only say, well, I think this or I think that, but unless you're around him or spend time with him, I mean, my, my goodness, the crew in that band, I mean, we were his family for 18 months, 26 months, you know, and then off the road, we're family again in the studio. Even with that, you only knew him so much. I mean, I'd never known a more generous, gentle, loving person. And, and it's I always laugh because I say, okay, I'm saying this about another man other than my dad or my kids, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he was some, someone that really, really just, just genuinely cared about people. Even if he didn't know you, he had a smile and I don't know you, but, but still, I, I, I've got love for you, you know. And we, the first time I saw that and experienced that was on that bad tour because we were, I mean, we opened, if I'm not mistaken, we opened in Tokyo. Yes, and, yeah. uh, and then came through Australia. and Yes, yeah, and then we were in Australia in December. And just to, to see the love of the people, I'll, I'll never forget, it was, it was so crazy for me. Tokyo, Japan made yen that had his face on it. I'll never forget that. They made actual currency that had his face on it. Wow. I'd never heard that before. Yes. Which yes. It's worth a mint now. Yes, they they made yen that had that had his face on it. I'm just blown away because initially we were in a a small baseball stadium that was connected to a to an amusement park and the next time we came back, well, not the exact next time, but the, when we came back on the Dangerous Tour, they had built this elaborate stadium, you know, and I was just like, my goodness. Wow. But uh, it was, I mean, I've, I've been around the world several times with him and to see the love. I mean, to look out in the audience and 90% of the fans couldn't, and, and, and that number may be high, couldn't speak English, but sung every lyric of his songs. Mm. And I always say, my goodness, if this world could be what these shows are for two and a half hours, look at all the love in this place. How come it can't be the same after the last note is sung and the last light is dim. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He said many times he saw it as, as his mission to bring hope to people through his music and sounds like that certainly was happening in the shows. The bad tour after that first leg that you're talking about through Japan and Australia, after that first leg, the show went through a major revamp for its second leg, which was uh, a lot bigger in its scope. Can you talk with me about that in interim period? Like, did you know the show was going to go through a big production change? Did Michael get you guys together and say why that was happening? In all actuality, we did not. Once we finished Japan and Australia, the biggest thing for him was it was going to be his first time in the States. And so we got here and as great as the shows went, in uh, Japan and Australia, he just felt more comfortable. There were some things that he wanted to pull from the set and some things he wanted to add to the set. And all, hey, all, all we can do is say, hey, let's go. Let's, let's get it. Let's do it. 
I believe we opened in Kansas City in the U.S. We knew how the press, we knew they were really going to be looking at every single aspect of the show. I mean, we knew they were going to truly, truly be watching everything, watching him every moment because the reviews overseas had been so phenomenal. It's tough, but I mean, you always have to take it up even another level when you're home because it's just like, you know, these are our worst critics. Is it really that great? Oh my God, the interviews, the this, the that, they're just saying it's, you've never seen anything like it. So they come out to, to, te to tear him up and to tear us up and he didn't want to leave anything to chance. And we came here to the States and, and just really rocked, really, really rocked, you know? And so we played here for up until spring. And then uh, in May, we took off to Europe and we stayed in Europe until uh, September. The Bad World Tour in particular, unlike maybe some of the later tours, featured a good mix of indoor shows as well as outdoor shows. For example, Madison Square Garden during the second leg. As a vocalist and somebody that was really interested in the vocal quality and audio quality of the shows, what was your preference? What do you think sounded better? Indoor is always better due to the fact that you can, the sound is controllable, if you will. Mm-hmm. To an extent, I mean, even when you have a, a, a packed house, our outdoor gigs uh, on the bad tour averaged 94,000. Now, when you're in a stadium and even with it packed plus on the floor, I mean, you still have to allow for sound to go to the back of that stadium and slap back, you know? Yeah in the indoor venues like the garden and places like that sports arena here in LA where we played it's packed in there and you can control the reverb a, a heck of a lot more you know the the sound can be deadened if you will a lot more and it's easier work for our front of the house engineers I mean even though there is so much for them. I mean, my hat is off to Tripp and Kevin Elson, who were uh, our house, front of the house engineers. It's a lot of work to engineer this gig because, I mean, you are responsible for people. People like to, man, I want to hear this just like I would hear the record or the CD, but the addition of being able to see a show. So it's up to that engineer to make that sound happen, as well as the performers. It's kind of interesting. I love the sound being indoors. I love the feeling of the show outdoors. Mm. You can just feel the people. It's a different feeling. I mean, inside is just controlled. Outside in those stadiums, it's just crazy, and, and crazy just gives you more energy and more excitement, and we can't see as much as we can indoors. We can't, indoors, it's uh, because it's so dark and we don't have the elements to deal with, I can only see my vision is maybe 10 to 15 rows in front of me, while outside, I mean, I mean, sure, you can see way in the back, but not like you can outside. Outside, you get to, we get to see people and we get to see them until it's really, really dark. And then that's when people start lighting their lighters on the <laughs> world and all that kind of stuff. And it's just a beautiful thing that you can't have indoors, naturally. Sound wise, for, for me, I mean, because we had great monitor mixers and by then, we were wearing uh, on the bad tour. I mean, that was the first, my first time wearing, you know, in-ear monitors. My sound was going to be amazing either way, but it's just 
the the difference between you know, like I said, being controlled and and not as much control. But I I, I like the wild side of the stadium gigs because the fans let their hair down, and when they let theirs down, we let ours down. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to know as well, in what specific ways would Michael and yourself collaborate on tour vocals? What sort of conversations did you and he have? Our biggest conversations were always, he wanted his background vocals to be exactly as they were recorded on the records. I mean, from from the... Like the Billy Jean's, like my luck. Ah, ah, ah. All, all those little nuances. He, if there was a, ah, or chica, whatever it may have been, I mean, whatever it may have been, he, he needed it. If he, I mean, um, when it, Billy Jean would have do, 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 there was always an inflection on that one note. And he would go over to whether it was Freddie or Sam, or Don, or Don on the bad tour, and he said, I need that. Do, 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 do. He had to have that hard pulse on that particular note, and and he he rode them until, yes, that's how it is, because he, even though Michael was not a musician, he he wrote with with his mouth and his voice, if you will. So, I mean... All the inflections that he would uh, give a bass player or a guitar player, what, what he'd give David or on the bad tour, what he'd give John or, or, or Jennifer. I mean, he needed to hear that, or as he say, he needed to feel it. He needed you. He would say, hurt me. I need to really feel that, you know. But vocally, he was real, real, real tough when it came to harmonies, like any vocalist would be pitch had to be spot on you know and and he would man he would ride you like sea biscuit if it wasn't you know (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but it sounds like i mean i've seen some footage of him giving feedback to crew it seems like he always did it quite directly but also with love he he sort of um, and I'm sure we'll get to talk about things like, you know, how This Is It turned out and everything later. But when, when you watch the movie This Is It, he's saying to some of the crew, like, I want it this way. You need to fix it so it's this way. But it's all for love. You know, it's all for love. Yeah. Did he balance it out, that criticism out for you with also that positivity? At times. But on the on the bad tour, because Slim was just get, he was just getting to know us. I mean, he was, he was really, uh, there would be kindness, but the closer we got to where it was time, we were getting closer. We were a, a month out from the stuff going on the boat and, and getting out of there. He became really no nonsense, if you will. Yeah. I mean, we're guys, we're a month out. Guys, we're three weeks out. Guys, we're two weeks away from this. This shouldn't be happening. It was more frustration than perfection then. And so a lot of times things were happening that, you know, hey, they, he, he was more frustrated with the production aspect of it because by, by then, two weeks out, we were, we were flawless, band-wise, vocal-wise, Dance wise, I mean, we were as flawless as humanly possible. Things happening in production, lighting crew, not enough smoke, not enough this, that the pyro went off at the wrong time, didn't go off enough, or this or that, you know, all those kind of things. We uh we weren't catching the backlash of that. But Musically, by the time we got down to, to two weeks, we were flawless. But he had gotten to the point to where if it wasn't perfect, because just because musically it was flawless, there were still flaws happening as far as production. And when something like that would happen, like in the final week before the stuff was going on the boat, if there would be a problem, light, 
pyro, whatever, he dropped that microphone and he head to his trailer. And that's when he, that's when we knew this was real, real serious because either he was going to come back after he calmed down in about an hour or he was security was coming out and he was going home. And if, and just because Mike went home, that just meant, uh, Vince Patterson would have to, uh, let's go from the top. Let's get at it just because he's gone because you never know. He would, he, he comes back 11 30, 12 at night. Let's, let's run it again. That's how that went. Wow. Well, well I mean, it, it sounds like it all paid off because the tour is so flawless. It's sort of like, it sounds to me like Michael was like the Steve Jobs type figure of these tours. Like he knew exactly yeah. what he wanted. He was tough about it, but the outcome was there. Yeah, you know, because it was his vision, you know, and it was up to, on the bad tour, it was up to Vince to visually make this happen. I mean, it was up to Vince. I mean, Peter, all those guys out in production, I mean, they had to make all of these things happen. I mean, we knew what our job was, you know, and it was after a while when it, when it became easy during rehearsal. And I, and I say easy due to the fact that we knew what was expected of us. We knew, you know, Hey, it was going to be grinding and you got used to it. You got used to that, to that hard, hard grind. And like I said, it, it made all of us so much better. I always laugh because when people talk to me about my career, no matter who I have worked with, and I've been blessed to, to work with, with, with all of the majors, I mean, it all still comes back to, you hear Kevin Dorsey, the person that comes out of their mouth, is Michael Jackson. Mm. That says it. It's not Elton. It's not Phil. It's not Sting. It's not Aretha Whitney, Luther. It's always Mike. It's always Mike. You know. So I mean, he truly, truly. I mean, as successful as I have been in my own right. I mean, I, I, I'd be crazy not to say so much of it was because of him. One of a kind. Yes. So moving forward, Kevin, the Dangerous World Tour was a massive leap in terms of production value, even beyond bad. Kenny Ortega came on board to help craft the show with Michael. Take us through what it was like to be on this particular tour, again, starting with the rehearsals and that production element. It was good because the Dangerous album was less poppy, if you will. This album was very, very R&B, very funk. It was interesting. And in during the rehearsals, they were really having a difficult time. I mean, we learned that entire Dangerous album. We, we learned it. Naturally, we did all of the singles. I mean, you know, they were it's going to be Remember the Time, In the Closet, all of the singles. And they did production to all of them as far as the dance and the this and that and everything else, he could not make up his mind what he wanted to keep. <laughs> yeah, remember the times in the rehearsals and, and not in the final show. Interesting that you say that because in a few cities, he would drop that in the set. There were certain cities that we were going in and and it was, uh, you know, we're doing, we're doing remember the time tonight. I can't let her get away. Yeah. We were dropping that in. <laughs> I was really surprised because when you start thinking and you're happy that you don't have to be on the accounting end of it, remember the time is a huge production piece because, I mean, all the dancers are, you know, doing their thing. And, man, initially when uh, rehearsals first began, I mean, we were doing the whole gong thing and the whole bit. I mean, we were all dressed up like, you know, Egyptians and pharaohs and all that. And then they pull that and just kept it to the dancers. He would like it sometimes. And when he didn't, he'd nix it. 
Mm. And then it would sh- it would show up again in the Canary Islands or something, you know, to see. And I always felt that he was trying to work something out and make something work in that. But there was something about Remember the Time that just never settled in with Mike. And if it didn't settle in, and he tried to make it work by, by like, I said, ah, it didn't do it tonight. And then you don't see it for another, you know, nine or ten shows, and suddenly, there it is again. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, that was him. That was him. There were so many, as you know, so, so many distractions going on during that tour. Yeah, yeah. And I want to get to that shortly because it would have absolutely rocked your world uh, what happened later on in it. Do you have any uh, particularly funny stories about Michael on tour? (laughs) We were on stage and uh, evidently Saida had kind of, for lack of a better term, upset some of the stage crew guys. Uh oh. You know, and and so uh, I said, there's nothing more dangerous than upsetting those guys. So we're doing, I, I just can't stop loving you. We're, doing, we're in the intro, and and Michael, you know, he comes out each time the wind blows. Da, 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 da. And so he's doing that. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, lighting and laser and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of, you know, smoke. And so we're standing there, we're singing, and I'm just like, is it a little extra smoky out here? <laughs> and the crew guys started cranking that smoke. And when Saida came out, you couldn't see her. We couldn't even see Michael. And she's fanning her arms and hand, trying to see where Michael is and all the smoke. And you can hear the crew guys back there. How do you like that? How do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and Michael is on the floor. He is crying, laughing so hard because she can't see where she is on stage. <laughs> you know, and and they were just saying some things that, that I won't say in this interview, but they, they really were teaching her a lesson to not mess with us, you know. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, that's, that, that's one of my, my funny stories with Mike. I mean, he literally was on the floor laughing. Oh, that's gold. That is phenomenal. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, and when you were working with him on, on tour, was there any just on the off chance ever time for you and him or the band and Michael just to, to, just to chat and reflect on things? You know, always being the vocal director and assistant MD and and then especially with Brad, the only time we would as a whole get a chance to to chat would be prior to showtime and prior to prayer. That's one of the only times other than on stage, all of us would be together. I mean, band, dancers, singers and Mike, we'd all be there. Uh at prayer time and, and, and before. So, you know, that would be a time where we would uh, laugh and chuckle and talk. And then, you know, after prayer, you know, we'd have our little thing that we always did to, to get us fired up and ready to go to the stage. But that would be usually, and like I said, unless we were out someplace at a amusement park or something like that, that was uh, usually the only time that we would... Uh, actually be out there and you know as a whole yes halfway through the dangerous tour there was another sort of change as well though before i'm sure you guys started to learn about michael's challenges but halfway through brad buxer actually replaced greg fillingade in in the role of musical director how was that for the crew and do you do you know the reason why that took place well, the reason that it had taken place is Greg had made a commitment with Eric Clapton prior to Dangerous Beginning. That's when he, and that was the thing where they did Clapton, Phil and Gaines, Nathan East, Steve Ferrone, originally from an average white band. We didn't know about that 
at least none of us did, until we were starting to get down to the brass tacks. And then we found out, we brought in John Barnes, who had done the uh, victory tour with the Jacksons. Amazing guy. We've spoken with John. Yes, yes. Super nice, very strong personality, but a hell of a keyboard player. And so Brad at the time was playing second keyboard and, uh, and, and Greg was playing lead. And so when it was time for him to leave and, and John came in, you know, it was just, if anyone knows Michael, Michael's not a, a man for change. He doesn't like change. You know, he tries to avoid that. In my personal opinion, he really, 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 really didn't, didn't like it that, that, that Greg was leaving, especially at that point of the tour. And uh, we did that because we had already were getting ready to, if we hadn't replaced him, we'd already gotten, uh, getting ready to change bass players, Freddie Washington. And, uh, and then we were bringing in Isaiah Sanders as, a, as an additional keyboard player. So a lot was, man, a lot was going on during it. I always call that tour, that was the, the bad luck tour. Yeah, well, I mean, it was it was so different as well. I mean, it was it was almost like you've got jetpacks, flying angels, inflatable globes, stages going up and down. What, what were your thoughts on, I mean, if the show was changing dramatically in direction from being a purely sort of musical performance or, or, or I should say the emphasis being on the musicality to then being on this massive production circus. What were your thoughts as an artist? Were you, did you like the direction it was going in that way? When we started with the globe and, and with Michelle, you know, flying around, you know, as an angel and the, the jumbotrons that we had, those things were massive. They, I think they were seven tons each, you know. I remember, I think the Dangerous album, or one of them, only did 26 million sales. And they call it a failure. How do you call that a failure when... Most you have artists who have been in the business 30 years and they'll never reach that amount of records, you know what I mean? It's sales. But he, Bad was so amazing. I always say that he always, well, we can't, we can't do amazing. We have to do beyond amazing. So dangerous had to be beyond amazing. And so here, here comes Kenny Ortega, you know, with let's, let me bring you Beyond Amazing, you know. And so here go more bells and whistles and, and Ringling Brothers and the whole gambit. And it got away from, as you said, the music was there. But I mean, when, when the music is there, the gags look good on paper, but if they don't win, after every show, he goes up to his suite and he watches the show from top to bottom. And he critiques the show, the production, the band, the singers, the dancers, and lastly himself. And when time and time again, you know, it's just like, hey, I don't see what I want to see. It's not doing what I want it to do. I'm not feeling, okay, this is the gag. It's going right, but it, it doesn't look right. And if it wasn't right for him, it wasn't right for the show. And, okay, nix it. We're not doing it. Something else. Let's do it. And let's find the next new thing, you know, and the greatness, the new amazing wasn't as amazing to him. He was looking for, for something else, and, and I don't think he ever found it while we were on Dangerous. Um, the fans were loving it, but um, as a whole, something about the production just never clicked like he wanted it to click, I think, you know, and, and you can't 
be out here on this multi-million dollar production and, and start pointing fingers at why it's not clicking, you know? Yeah. The Dangerous Tour was famously cut short quite abruptly due to Michael's addiction to pain medication. And the first round of sex abuse allegations probably had a major part to play in this eventuation as well. It's kind of scary for fans to think how close Michael came to the outcome we saw in This Is It, but during the Dangerous Era. Did, did you personally see any warning signs on the tour of deterioration? I did not. I want to say that was also during the time that we were doing an HBO special in New York, and, and it never happened. And I never knew that any, any of that was going on until we were doing the show. We were in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. And Elton, uh, and I don't know if you know about this, and I don't mind saying it. I mean, Elton came and got him and, and took him, from what I hear, you know, to a rehab. I knew Liz Taylor did that towards the end of the tour, but I, I never knew that Elton John became involved as well. Yeah, I know because we had a break for two weeks and no one knew, at least I didn't. I'll say that I, I, I didn't know what was going on, you know, other than other than he, he was ill. That's that's what we were told. And hey, we hadn't had no reason to think anything else. Yeah. At the MJ cast, we, we love talking about the great artistry and Michael the musician, but we also try to like to get to the bottom of the truth around certain things. And when you, when you go back and listen to the court depositions of um, Michael's employees during the Dangerous Tour, especially people like doctors and makeup artists, and it's quite sad what was going on behind the scenes when that show finished, um, what was going on back in his hotel room, what he was doing to deal with the stress and the pain. It sounded like he, he was not uh, in a good place. And see, things like that we, we didn't do because usually, unless we were in a city that had only one amazing hotel, I mean, we always usually, the, the band and dancers and singers, we, we all stayed in a different hotel than, than Mike, which, and that was good because, you know, love the fans to death but you know all night long you know <laughs> singing and stuff like that and, and we had to get some rest to be to be able to give them the best performance that they deserved you know yeah the only time we'd see him unless there was something that was really wrong and he'd call us up to the room we'd see him possibly you know before the show when he'd say there's some changes or he's going to do this or do that or something happen and you know concentrate on that and check that out and other than that that was it so what was it like inside your camp in camp mj when the tour was unraveling shows were being cancelled it finally did get cancelled what was it like for you guys it didn't really hit home until mexico city and they collected all of our passports i mean we were in mexico city for a month we couldn't leave. That's when we knew, okay, this is, we knew it was serious, but it was really serious because, I mean, you know, none of us were being uh, deposed or anything else, but they were making sure none of us were going anywhere. Mm. And, uh, and we stayed there and we went to, hey, the other shows were coming through town. So we went to see Madonna. We went to see Prince. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, we were their guest. So, I mean, you know, all of us knew each other anyway. So, I mean, we just, we had a, a month's vacation. When you'd learned about things like the addiction and, and the allegations, did you guys ever feel it was appropriate to reach out to Michael and see how he was doing? Or was it more the, a vibe of like, hang on, we're employees. That's not our place to discuss those things with him. There was such a lid on that, and believe me, as close as, as all of us were, and I say this very seriously, I don't know if maybe I was just not the fly on the wall, but I never knew until, uh, hey, until the media, actually. Yeah. 
you know, there was never any, hey, let's let's get together and 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 see if he'll talk to us about this, that, that. I mean, we didn't know. We did not know when things were I knew, okay, if there was a a root canal, there was he has a cold and Seth Riggs is coming over to to try and do something, you know, for his voice. And this, those are the things that, that we were hearing. We weren't hearing any of the, of the you know, the little pss, pss, pss stuff that, you know, Karen and those guys would hear, you know, in, in hair and makeup and stuff like that. Because, I mean, they spent hours upon hours alone with him. Yeah. That wasn't our roles. Our roles, look. We had two hours and 26 minutes on stage. Yeah. That was that. Outside of that, you know, if we would, you know, uh, as a group or as a family, as he would say, go, you know, to Disneyland or an amusement park or we went to Tokyo. We all went to see James Brown. I mean, all that was fine. O- other than that, I mean, it was it was a uh, business, other, you know, or we go shopping or something like that. But. Nothing that ever caused us to think that it was more than a toothache or a cold or a, you know, pulled muscle or something like that. Yeah. Got it. So pretty much would have hit, hit you guys like a six. And before, before we get into the History World Tour, I, I got to finish this one off on a, on a bit of a positive note. Even though the dangerous era or ended on a bit of a downer and a negative note, looking back on the tour, what would you say – was the highlight for you of the tour or even the show in terms of the songs? I really enjoyed the change of the music feel. I mean, because everything prior to that was great, but it was straight pop. And to see how he performed when it came to the the R&B hard funk stuff, there were different highlights in and dangerous. It's it's so difficult to to pick out like just a particular highlight when when bad had gone so perfectly, if you will. Yeah. You know, and um, and there were just no if you had someone interfering, they were interfering out of goodness and out of something that was going to lift the show. All the interferences here were were just just horrible and then you know you we get to london and you know we got the wacko jacko and and i always laugh because i mean they have it seems like more tabloids than they do regular paper yeah but we love performing there i mean there's 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 nothing like performing at wembley stadium and at the time, Princess Diana, she liked hanging out with Mike. I'll never forget. And this was probably a great highlight. We were saying the prayer, and here comes security, and next thing it's Prince Charles coming to ask Mike not to perform Dirty Diana. <laughs> and Michael, naturally, I'm going to honor your request. And next thing you know, here's Princess Di afterwards telling him, I want you to sing it like you've never sung it before. (laughs) And that's exactly what he did. And from stage, you can look over into the royal box, and he's sitting there like a bump on a log with his arms crossed, and she's up jamming. (laughs) You know? So, uh... What a great story. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) Let's get into history. So... The History World Tour was, again, a massive leap in terms of production value with Kenny Ortega returning. We've got spacecraft crashing through the stage, tanks rolling out onto the stage. Uh, Again, take us through what it was like to be a part of the History World Tour rehearsals and the lead up to that show. When you have so much going on, you know, the space shuttle and like you said, you know, the, the Sherman tank from Tiananmen Square, but, uh, the production aspect and the rehearsals for that, once again, were tedious due to the fact that we were coming off, we were coming off dangerous. And so uh, that was 
more, we were back into the intensity of touring because now everything had to be, we had to put dangerous in the back of our minds. And, and now once again, we're coming, trying with hopes of not upstaging the bad tour, but being bad and more. Mm. He was back to being very, very serious. He always been serious, but, but now he didn't have all that madness on his mind to contend with. Yeah. You know, we just had to prepare ourselves once again. A lot of productions, Kenny was coming off of Newsies because Kenny directed that film, Newsies, the big musical film. Everything just once again, big, 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 big. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of work went into it. A lot of work always goes into them. But I mean, once again, they had to, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, prove a point. And that was, you know, that was just that. We're going, going to prove that I'm back. I'm, I'm even better than I was. And, uh, and we were behind him to do that. I've heard that the rehearsals were particularly difficult for history because of the fact they were in an airport hangar and it was extremely hot. Yeah. Benny Collins and Chris, they had to uh, bring in huge, huge air conditionings. It was... I mean, just awful. It is not a, how do you say it, a conditions person. <laughs> you know, we had to change. We would have, we would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. And when they'd say, okay, it's, it's cool in here, and they'd call him, he would make his way over to the rehearsal. That was that. And... <laughs> And everybody's wanting to, we got you, don't worry about it. This is going to be great. It's going to be great, you know. And, and we got through rehearsals amidst all that idiosyncrasies of, of burning up and everything else. But we got through it and, uh, and headed out, you know. And comparatively, would you, you? I mean, you were on all the major tours, so I mean, this was the last one that you worked on with Michael, um, tour-wise. Would you say that comparatively, Michael was equally engaged and excited all the with each tour? You know, I will say this: he was always engaged once on stage, no matter what happened business-wise or whatever in the heck, you know, went on. Whenever he went on stage, he was at home. Yeah. And that's where, to me, he was always his most happiest was, was on that stage because no harm could come to him there. He controlled every aspect of it that he could. I mean, he... He relished in the love that he was receiving from the audience. That was just home. I'll never, I'll always say that to me, overall, he worked undeniably his hardest on that bad tour. On Heal the World, you know, it, it would just depend on how he was feeling. I mean, there were some nights where he'd do Billy Jean and he just wanted to keep singing during that before the breakdown of his dance. There's like a little part in there that kind of that he almost goes to church, if you will. Yeah, he's ad libbing a lot on it. Yeah, yeah. And he and he just wanna stay there. You know, and and I was man and and that would just fire us up even more and more and more. And then he would like, whoa, let me get back. I'm, I'm, I'm in the show. I'm in the show. And uh, it's time to go to the dance. And then it's, then it's back to it. But uh, he always gave his all, in my opinion. I mean, even when he wasn't feeling well, you know, if it wasn't his all, it was everything that he had at that particular time. 
you know? Got it. Okay. The next question I want to ask is a delicate one, Kevin. And sometimes when I ask um, people this, they <laughs> they get a bit nervous in how to answer. So, but you're you're really the expert on this topic. We want to get to the bottom of it. I mean, we know studying Michael is a complex business, and on the one hand, he's talked about as the greatest entertainer that ever lived. But on the other, we see a very gradual increase and reliance on um, lip syncing from the second half of the Bad Tour onwards. Only a couple of songs on the Bad Tour, just under half of Dangerous. And then when you get to history, most of the songs are lip synced. And then many standalone performances and one-offs as well. Now, as you said earlier in the interview, in, and in, in This Is It movie as well, Michael talks about it as like he wants the songs to sound exactly like they do on the record. But we also know there were health issues going on at this time for Michael. Regardless, we've seen things like written notes from the History World Tour where where Michael would say things like, Billie Jean has to be in the box, meaning lip synced. Being Michael's longtime vocal director, you are the man to break this down for us. Did you talk with him about this gradual change? You know, first and and foremost i i will say to do a show of this magnitude and of this energy is for lack of a better term one of the most difficult things in the world when you're a front person like mike who doesn't have a change of gears. Everything is just high speed or nothing. Now, one thing that we did was if in fact he was what what I would call gassed, which is just just tired, tired, tired. I mean, he would, you know, he would hold up a finger and and that meant we needed to switch, you know, to to the other boys. Yeah. And that would happen until he truly had his breath. And, you know, from dancing with the guys and everything else, okay, I'm I'm ready. I, I can go back and do it. He put up his hand and that goes back to him live. You know? And This is the first time I'm actually, I mean, I've been asked about it a lot. I've never gone in it this deep as I, as I am now, but I mean, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, it, it takes a lot out of you to do the dance numbers and sing live and continue going at once again, the only way he knows. Did I notice it more? down through the years and the tours. Yes, I did. There's there's, there's not a whole heck of a lot I can say about it. I mean, as anyone likes to say, no one, we, we all hate getting old. Very high energy show, very high speed show. With Dangerous, I know... It happened more because there was so much more on his mind. Mm -hmm. There was so much that was trying to take away from his show concentration. And we, man, the bad tour, we did an awful lot of shows. And I know they were trying to cut them back on Dangerous because When you work like that, when you sing like that, when you give like that, I mean, the body's not something, and let alone the throat is not something that you can turn on and off like an instrument. I mean, it's going to take its toll, and and it was taking its toll. I don't care if Seth Riggs or anyone else was coming out trying to warm him up and do this and do that. I mean... The body is exactly what it is. I mean, it only can take so much. And so there in lied the increase of of going to the box even more. So now you have health issues. You have 
the media issues, you have the allegation issues. So, I mean, Dangerous was just tanking day by day. You know what I mean? I think that's a really good way to put it and a wise way to put it. And it's hard to talk about because when Michael was doing bad, he was literally at his live performance peak. There was no trickery. It was all just full out dancing, start to finish, full out singing, start to finish. Nothing will ever take away from that. But I think sometimes the fan community likes to sort of pretend that it was that amazing all the way through until the end. But I think we need to be honest about what happened there. And I think that's a really great explanation for why there was a bit more reliance on lip syncing. I think ultimately Michael probably chose, it was a conscious decision to keep the production, to to favor the dancing and the production element, the spectacle of it more so. Yeah. And you know, I mean, when it would come to televised things, a lot of times once we've done the show and they go back and it's time to edit and do all this and that, he wants to sound his best, you know, for his fans. I remember when we did the Super Bowl and uh, I was I was very proud of that because he was the first superstar to actually do a halftime performance at the Super Bowl. And uh, we went and we played everything and I mean, they... They recorded us live there prior to the actual performance. And uh, because, like I say, you're going to have just so much kickback and there's only so much control you can have over the elements, you know. And so, I mean, that's going to be a lip sync show. That's just it. And, And some of the other performances... You want to do that because he wanted to concentrate on the physical performance as well, you know, as as the vocal. I mean, because so many people come to see, quote unquote, the show. I mean, the music that they hear, they're happy with and they love. But I mean, they just wanted to see him do his thing, you know, and that's something he he never wanted to let them down. He always wanted, if I'm going to have this extra boost of energy, I was going to do it and use it to give them what they came to see. He was in a really difficult position because imagine going to a Michael Jackson show when he was aging a little bit and it was no it was no dancing. It was great singing, but there's not the moves. There's not the... <laughs> I think he was in a difficult choice yeah. having to choose between those two things in the end. But Exactly. I have one last question about lip syncing, but it's more to do with the rehearsal stuff. What's fascinating is that the Dangerous Tour rehearsals, we've actually got video of those, and they're um, Mm -hmm. completely live. The whole thing is live. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about history as well. If you can try to remember back to those rehearsals in the airport hangar, do you know if A, they were sung live, and B, were those rehearsals also filmed? They were filmed, to be quite honest, they were really... As far as the the vocals in the hangar, they were really preserving him. I mean, it it was a lot of work in that heat on that stage. And, you know, it, it was difficult due to the fact that, I mean, we were out there because the media, the paparazzi were were really, you know, hunting him down, trying to see what was going on. He'd go through the dance routines. Some days he'd go through them just enough to make sure timing is right and this and that. Other days, there's Mike. He said, just, let me just make sure I got this and I'm still this. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, some days, you know, he'd sing full out. Other days, it'd be too hot and it's smoking in there. And uh, and we just run, we run the track, you know, yeah. I mean. That place, it was tough out there. Brad and I, you know, Brad was a uh, commercial pilot. He and I would fly back each night for corrections or anything we needed to do to make that show better. We were flying back from rehearsal and flying to rehearsal every day. (laughs) I just think it's so awesome how the History Tour's musical director and vocal director were able to arrive to and leave from rehearsals in a private plane that one of you guys was flying. Very, very cool. 
Uh, look, I want to take another little break so that we can talk about something else that's new to the MJ cast. For those of you who have listened to the MJ cast for a long time, you would have heard my co hosts and I talk a bit about launching a shop. Q and I, for example, talked about an MJ cast shop for many, many years and we always wanted to make it happen. And, and recently, Elise and I were able to launch it just before the start of season six. And if you follow us on social media at the MJ cast, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, you definitely would have seen us promote it. Now, if you want to visit our shop, all you have to do is go to themjcast.com slash shop. We sell a lot of different merchandise on there for the MJ Cast podcast, including six designs, and I'll talk a little bit about each of those. The first one is by far our biggest seller, and it's our logo. It's our podcast logo with Michael Jackson in that Billy Jean pose from the History Tour, but it is designed a little differently with a bit of a sunset type design to it. Our second design, which is my personal favorite, the one I definitely spent the most amount of time on, is a pixel art version of the Jacksons on the Victory Tour. So think a 90s point-and-click pixel art adventure game. You'll be able to visualize what that kind of looks like. We've also got another design. I think it's called Nine Logos. And it's actually got all nine variants of our MJ Cast logo on there in a grid pattern. And it's also been a really good seller. You'll know from following us on social media, we've got seasonal variants of our logos, Christmas ones, Halloween ones, and it just puts them all in one place. Our last three designs all use the same kind of design or template, I guess. And I'm sure you've seen people rocking around with them before, but those Helvetica typography list style shirts, we've made three different kinds of those. One of them is a Jackson's one, so it's got all the brothers' names on there, including Randy. And we've also got a Captain EO one, which I know is Elise's personal favorite of these these ones. And she, uh, she loves Captain EO. So we've got all the crew members of Captain EO's ship on that design. And then finally, Michael's solo albums in that particular design. So those six designs are available on the mjcast.com slash shop. And the most common way to get them is on a t-shirt or a hoodie or something like that. We certainly sell a lot of t-shirts, but you know what? We've got a whole heap of different things as well. We've got mugs, travel mugs for coffee, phone cases, prints and artworks, tote bags, all kinds of different things, notepads, just you name it, we've got it. If you go to the mjcast.com slash shop, you'll be able to see all of our different products. The only thing is when you're getting a t-shirt, make sure you're considering what sort of thickness to get. I'll give you an example why that's important. So Redbubble, which is the company we use for our shop, they manufacture everything and distribute it out, send it out. And uh, they're really, really great. Now, I had a situation recently where I bought a classic style T-shirt. It's got a bit of a thicker material to it. But Australian climate is pretty hot. So I realized in hindsight, I probably should have got the slim fit, thinner material. And all I had to do was contact Redbubble service. And this is how good they are. Not only did they give me a refund, but they also let me keep the shirts as well and gave me an extra gift voucher on top. (laughs) All because I'd accidentally ordered the wrong type of material they wanted me to have a great service so they made all of that happen and uh, this is why we decided to go with Redbubble because they offer amazing service before you buy the product and also after now all proceeds from these sales go to show running costs like our server costs website costs all of that podcast hosting and also charity Elise and I are very passionate about giving back to charity and also equipment to keep our podcast sounding fresh, whether it's new microphones or things like that. One of the benefits of buying something from the MJ Cast shop is not only will you have a product that you can publicly promote the MJ Cast podcast with, but you'll be promoting Michael Jackson all at the same time. Last year was a challenging year. We had Leaving Neverland and let me tell you, wearing a MJ Cast or Michael Jackson shirt or item out or taking a tote back out or something like that is just an awesome feeling. You're out there in public with a cool MJ design promoting the king of pop in public. Great conversation starter. People are always looking at my uh, shirt designs uh, when I'm wearing them and saying, where'd you get that? That looks awesome. So uh, make sure you go to themjcast.com slash shop 
to support us at the MJ Cast and pick up some cool kit that you can get around with in public. Uh, if you do grab something, make sure to take a pic of yourself and share it on social media. Just tag us at the MJ Cast, and we will be sure to share that all around. Well, let's get back to hearing some more great stories from Kevin Dorsey. Kevin, I got to ask, you were the vocal director on Michael's tours. You're a backup singer for Michael. I've got to know vocally, what are some of your favorite Michael Jackson songs? Let me see. Earth Song, Man in the Mirror. Believe it or not, I used to love the groove of Heartbreak Hotel. Mm -hmm. Stranger in Moscow starting something even though it's a difficult song with all that mama say mama saw <laughs> that's my favorite michael um, jackson song <laughs> yeah <laughs> another of my favorite is smooth criminal mm -hmm. it, it, that that just has a vibe to it uh another part of me remember the time off the wall off the wall i used to really like when we did that I don't know how he how he went in the studio and did songs like the 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 whole call and response end of Earth song. He must have totally shredded his voice after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was uh, when we were doing all that. What about us in the studio? That's that was just uh, huge. I mean, because we'd always bring in Andre Crouch and his choir. It would just when he would when he would start, you know. What about Abraham? What about this? What about that? I'm just man. And when he get on stage, I'd wonder. I say, you stomping on that floor? You making my feet hurt? You stomping so hard? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but he would be so into that. So. uh and that's something we haven't really talked about is your studio work. Did you did you also spend a lot of time working with Michael's vocal in in the studio over the years? You know, not a lot to be quite honest. I mean, you you have to remember one thing I I always respected about him. He prided himself in other than big songs, other than huge songs that needed the different colorization of vocals. He liked to do his own background vocals. He would double, triple, quadruple. I mean, that was, he was famous for that, which is why he worked so hard and made it so difficult for us to, it had, to, he said, look, you have to sound like me. <laughs> oh, thanks, Michael. Easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and, and and that is just uh and that was it you have to sound like me and no matter you know that was that yeah and i love that about michael like it's that you know it's it's similar to me like uh marvin gay's sort of multi-layered backgrounds on his songs is something that's quite unique as well to michael and janet janet does this as well yeah, exactly. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful. The song Money on the History Album is a good example of that to me. Just total background, yes. layers and layers of it. Setting aside live performances and thinking about Michael's studio work as well, even as a fan like us and a listener like us of Michael's solo career, talk to us about how you think Michael evolved as a vocalist over those albums, over those years like the, the songs that they have out now. But, I mean, there's one with Justin. There's another one that Drake has something on. And, and first of all, knowing him, first of all, his vocals, those are demo vocals. Those, those are demos, and they should be ashamed of themselves, uh, the estate, for allowing those vocals to go out because they're certainly nowhere near what he would do as a final vocal. Mm -hmm. And every time I hear one of those, I'm just like, come on guys, you, you, you're kidding me that you just, you put that stuff out there because there's, it's not MJ. It's him doing a, a demo vocal. Okay. I might like this, but it was never something to where he put his foot into it 
and said, yeah, I'm doing this. So shame on them for putting that out there. I watched him grow and evolve and get stronger and smarter as, as a vocalist. I also watched him be challenged as a vocalist because, I mean, like anyone, as once again, as we, as we get older, I mean, our instrument can remain fine tuned, but it's going to change. And, and there were times where I'm sure, you know, he never said anything to me, but he struggled with that because, I mean, your vocal range as you get older, it can't help but change. I mean, that's, that's, that's God. That's not you. There's nothing you can do about that. He worked hard. He fought hard to maintain that vocal excellence, you know, and, and he did that all the way up until, you know, he, he couldn't. And I, and I, I personally noticed that in, in songs that were chosen and things of this nature. When, when he did This Is It, I mean, he, he truly meant that. He truly wanted to do one more for all of the people who had loved him for so, so many years. And he wanted to do all of their favorites and this and that and the other. Because, it, hey, it was time to hang it up. It was time to be dad. And he truly only wanted to do that handful of shows for his fans. And they turned it into, they were trying to turn it into a circus. You're going to get out here and make every dime for us that you can get the get it while the getting's good and and that's when that started to go downhill but but hey something that's a little surprising in hindsight for us fans is that you weren't actually involved in the this is it rehearsals similarly Brad who you just mentioned he wasn't there either as MD that that task was handed off to Michael Bearden Lavelle Smith Jr another uh, close collaborator of Michael Jackson was more or less replaced by Travis Payne. These changes in hindsight are a little bit alarming to fans. Were you in contact with Michael in the lead up to This Is It? When you say uh, it was a surprise to the fans, it was a surprise to, to us. We were in all of the meetings prior to rehearsals. I put together the This Is It band. Uh, with the exception of Michael Bearden. It was, at at the time, it was myself and Greg Fillingaines. Literally, the day of the first rehearsal, I came to the gate to come in to get started. I mean, like I said, I'd been in all the meetings with Kenny and added Tommy Organ. I'd done this, I'd done all that went to the gate to come in for rehearsal and was stopped by security. And, and I said, what's going on? And they said, uh, you're not on the list. I'm just like, whoa. Next thing I know, Paul Gongaware came out and said, Michael has decided to go in a different direction when it comes to the band. And I said, wow, okay. And I I went home and uh, I called Evie over at at MJ's office. And Evie said, Kevin, where are you? I said, I'm at home. She said, why aren't you at rehearsal? I said, "Uh, I was just told that, that Michael's decided to go a different direction. And she said, he would never do that. He doesn't know this. And I said, well, that's what I was told. The next day it came out that myself and Greg and and Lavelle had, we were having, there were contract disputes and this and that. And we hadn't even discussed, literally, we hadn't discussed it. I mean, other than Paul Gongaware telling us, you know, hey, numbers were going to change from before, blah, blah, blah. And okay, this is getting ready to be the MJ Swan song that 
that each of us had, had, had been wanting to happen, even though all of us had been working and, and just having a great time with other jobs, gigs, and everything else. But, I mean, we all had been waiting for this. Literally, we had, we had been waiting for this. Our guitar player, David Williams, who uh, Mike said, I would never tour without him. As soon as Mike announced it and uh, they had contacted me, I called David. I said, here we go. Here's that swan song. A few weeks later, unfortunately, David had a stroke and passed. Mm. You know, and, uh, and like I said, I was all the meetings with Kenny and Lavelle and and everything about this and putting the band together, I was doing all that, and suddenly, no more. That was it. it. It was a sudden thing. It wasn't like you didn't get the feeling in these later meetings, like things are changing here, Kenny, Michael, they're not as engaged, they want to go somewhere else. It, it was a sudden, you walked into that arena thinking you were it. Yeah. I, I had no other, you know, nothing that ever gave me... Uh, an inkling of uh, that anything had changed or or anything like that. I mean, I, all my papers, my notes, and all the phone calls with Kenny, the meeting with Kenny, like I said, I put the This Is It band together. This story hasn't really been heard. I know you talked about it in the studio with MJ, but this is huge. Yeah, I mean, no one, like I said, with the exception of... Bearden. And, it, and here's the strange thing. When they brought Bearden on, he and I had a conversation because he and I had never met. And uh, I called him to welcoming him to the gig. And, uh, and, and we spoke very briefly. And, uh, and, you know, he says, you know, I like to run things a lot differently than Greg or Brad, and I say, hey, you know, that's yeah, you, it's, that's your job. You're the MD, you know. And uh, I said, I'll see you at rehearsal. Got to rehearsal, and literally, I didn't get into the arena. I didn't get past the front gate of security, and that was that. So, you know, it was uh, it was upsetting to the point of not being able to do it. And when Evie told me, you know, Michael didn't know about that. And, and I'll always say that for whatever reason, those that were the closest to him when it came to performing, I feel that they were trying to cut that tie. And uh, I mean, I heard all of the stories where he's not happy he doesn't want to do this. He only wanted to do those 15 shows. They're making him do, you know, the the clips from This Is It. I mean, he only went to certain a certain amount of rehearsals. Other than that, he was rehearsing at the house with the dancers. And uh, once again, like I said, I heard he was not happy. And And one thing I'll always take with me they said there was a post-it on his nightstand that was found when he passed that, that said simply, get me my band back. Mm. You know, so you hear all of the rumors and the this to that and everything that, that were said, but, um, I always say, oh my God, he said he'd never tour without David, and he didn't. Mm. You know? What's fascinating, I think, as well, is that these people you're talking about who were around Michael when he died, even creatively, are the ones that sort of ended up going on to become very close with the estate later on. For example, Travis Payne and even Kenny Ortega and John Branker, who now is is basically the, the estate He's the estate executor. These people who swooped back around Michael in his final weeks are the people who now 
just promote, I guess, the lie that was this is it. The film, they're very reluctant to critique ex- estate decisions. They were out there in the weeks after Michael died telling the public he was amazing in great spirits and great health. And obviously that didn't turn out to be true once we started to hear what they were saying under oath in court with Michael in rehearsal only able to feel one side of his body and being slapped around literally by the AG people. What is your take on on this? You know, do you go as far as saying that these people who were there in the weeks before Michael died were conspiring against him? What is your take? Travis was and and still is a great dancer, great choreographer and and I've I've always liked him i've never i I, and you have to forgive me i I didn't listen to a lot of the the trial uh, after his passing kenny and and those guys i mean franca i mean john had been his attorney for quite some time but john was also fired by michael prior to him dying Mm -hmm. and how do you become executor (laughs) when you've been let go and demanded to hand all documents pertaining to michael jackson back (laughs) (laughs) including wills (laughs) you know i mean man it it seemed like everyone for whatever reason wanted to boy this is my chance to to prosper and my 15 minutes of fame and this and that and everything else. I mean, to capitalize on the death of someone who has done nothing but lift your life for so many years. I think I'm the only one. All the interviews that they called me for to do when Mike passed, I I refused. I didn't do one. And then finally, Rolling Stone called me and they said, we know you've turned everyone down, but but listen. And they said, we're doing a book and we will allow you to to read before it goes to print, whatever, whatever your interview was. And Rolling Stone had always been quite fair to Mike. So I, I told them yes. And that's the that's the only one that I that I ever did after he passed. And it was a, quite a while uh, after he passed. I mean, everybody was doing TV interviews, radio, this and print and blah and blah. And I'm just like, guys, really? Why would I want to? you know, capitalize. Everyone has always said, I'm the one they're waiting to read the book. You know, that I'm the one that should be writing the book. And uh, I remember a guy asked me to do it and and he said, what would you write about? And, and I told him if I did it, it would be this. And he said, you know something, that's, that's not going to sell. You need to write something that was almost on the edge of libel. And I'm just like, what? You know, I said, I don't have any dirt. I have fun, fun, fun memories. I have so many fun things, so many warm, amazing things. I mean, Michael Jackson afforded me to do a lot of things in my life that I don't believe I would have been able to do at that time. He allowed me to see the world over and over again and meet amazing people that are still in my life today. How could I turn around and just want to say this and say that? And, you know, I'm Kevin the Great and this, that, that. No, <laughs> no, no. Well, you've done some pretty great you know. things, let's be honest, but I know what you're saying. I know what you mean. And one of the reasons we were drawn to you so much, and I said to Elise, we've got to talk to Kevin, is because of how honest and truthful you you know you came across in in the in the in the studio with mj talk and it sounds to me like you're somebody who really wants to honor michael's memory and 
especially the truth, you know, the truth around his memory. Yes, and uh, I have actually, I, I have a, a television show that uh, that I am getting ready to to see what happens, and uh, unfortunately, I can't talk too much about it now, but it's going to feature his band. Cool. And and actually how Michael Jackson and Michael Jackson alone changed our lives. It will, I'll tell you this, it will take place in all of the major places where he performed. And uh, there will be celebrity interviewers if it works out, if it works out, you know, each each celebrity interviewer will perform one of their favorite Michael songs in the show. And uh, and then the last, the very last show, if it works, the interviews will be done by Paris, Prince, and Blanket. Wow. To talk to his band on how we were with their dad. And then the last the last show would be an actual concert that would feature all the celebrities that interviewed us and and uh and all the proceeds would go to Michael's favorite charities. Please keep us up to date with what's going on with that show because that sounds so exciting and the exact thing that the fans would rally behind for sure. Yes. Yeah. Kevin, we want to clear up a, a couple of things. We've got a few more questions. One of the things I want to clear up, because I think it's a big misconception in your story, mm-hmm. is, and mm-hmm. this is a misconception that was perpetuated um, by the estate. Now, on this misconception, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the 2010 controversy around the, the, the fake Michael Jackson songs that were released on his first posthumous album. Um, but when the estate was trying to handle all of this controversy, and uh, there are three songs on that album that feature a um, like an impersonator vocalist, his family, Michael's family, was like pleading with the estate to not release them, but they still did. Howard Weitzman released a statement saying, and this is just one sentence in it, but he says that Dorian Holly was Michael Jackson's vocal director for his solo tours for twenty years. Why would Howard Weitzman put forward that discrepancy when we know that you were the vocal director? You know, I I, I, I don't know, and uh, that's uh, one of the things I you know I just I, I I laugh at and I smile and I and I just say you know there are millions of people around the world who who know the truth in that. I don't know why it was said. Shame on Howard. My God, you can, even if you just go to the tour booklets and you will see Kevin Dorsey, vocal director, assistant musical director. I mean, it's there in plain print, you know? So, you know, I I don't allow things like that to, to, to bother me. Everything that happened after, like I said, it seems like all of the people who were the closest to him, that they tried to, for whatever reason, ostracize or just besmirch the relationship. Not saying that Kevin Dorsey was Michael's best friend or just best chum and just hung out day and night. No, but I was someone who worked hard for him, gave one million percent each and every night and each from rehearsal to the show, you know, and always, always did nothing but uplift him and deservedly so. And I did that prior to being a parent and certainly feeling just as good and just as strong in doing it after I became a parent. Yeah. I mean, after he was uh, absolved of all that madness and we all went to the ranch, I mean, 
my daughter was the first kid that he held. Wow. When he came from court, you know, and she was, uh, I don't know if she was one or two at the time. You know, when I hear things from the estate and people say things that are untrue, and I mean, and, and that's something that's so obvious, that's an untruth. Well, what was Dorian's actual role then? If he wasn't the vocal director, and we know you were, could you clear up for us what his role really was on these tours? Dorian was a background vocalist. Got it. And that's it. That is it. Daryl Finnessy was the vocal director on the Bad Tour and part of Dangerous, and I took over on the back end of Dangerous from there on out. Got it. And, uh, and, and then also became assistant musical director. Got it. Here's a question that we ask every single one of our guests we ever have on the show. Kevin Dorsey, how do you think Michael Jackson should be remembered? He should first be remembered for, his, for the music that he gave the world, for the love that he gave so many people, a very giving person, a very humble person, very egotistical on that stage because he owned it, he commanded it, a very misunderstood person, a person who, and I'll tell you this, and you have to forgive me, Lavelle Smith and I were with Michael in his trailer during Michael and Friends, we were rehearsing. And I was getting ready to leave to go back into the sound stage. And Michael said, you know I'm not going to live long. And I said, hey, 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 don't, don't, don't say that. Well, come on, come on, don't say that. And Lavelle said, yeah, what's wrong with you? Don't say that. He said, look at history. John Lennon. He say Hendrix. He's, he just started naming all of the celebrities and rock stars who had passed in their prime. And he, he said, they don't want me to live long. I bring too much love. I bring too much peace and happiness and joy to, to the world, to all people, not to every race, to every religion, to every culture. He said, they don't want that. They don't want that. And I said, well, I, we want you to live forever. I'll never forget that sitting in this trailer and he told Lavelle and I that, that story. Also, you know, I want him to just be remembered as a good man, a good person, a great human being, and someone that I wish was still here so that we can do it all over again. Yep. Kevin, I just want to say thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for coming on the MJ cast. I really appreciated talking to you. It's been incredible insight into the world of Michael mm -hmm. Jackson, into your history as an, as an amazing artist, musician as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me, and and good luck to you guys, and uh, I will keep you posted about that show. Yeah, is there anything else you want to tell our audience about that might be coming out, stuff to look forward to from you? Uh, you know, no, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm getting older now, so I'll just let it be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> is there anywhere online that you have a social media presence? Is, uh, is there somewhere fans can contact you if they want? You know, they can, from Facebook to, uh, there's a little site we have called Sound Vision Entertainment Group. They can go there. But on Facebook, I mean, I when I get a chance, we'll certainly respond and chat. And yeah, I'm, I'm not one of those people who aren't reachable. You know, they can yeah. always go there and, and get me. And I, I love to hear what they have to say because I mean they have helped make me and people appreciate me and what I do and I appreciate the fan base so very much. 
And if listeners want to find us as well, we're, of course, all over social media. We are at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all as the MJ Cast. And I'm not on there very much. On Twitter, I am. But on the other networks, you'll mainly be talking to Elise, my co-host, if you're over there. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to the MJ Cast as a podcast. That is the way we like to be heard. It's the best way to be heard because you get... Things like chapters that you can move back and forth around with on the phone. You get show notes that you can tap on as you're listening and follow links. All kinds of amazing things. The shows get delivered to you uh, when they get released. You don't have to go find them. You'll get a notification saying they're ready. But we are also on YouTube if you want to find us there. It's more of a public service where we put our shows on YouTube for people who haven't quite got used to how to use podcasts yet. But that's all right. And uh, listen, if you want to email us as well, then you can email us at themjcast at icloud.com. We have got a really great season ahead planned, especially the next couple of episodes. I know you're going to love them. And uh, just drop us a line on our email and uh, let us know what you're thinking of our show. And of course, don't forget to hit up crackcorn.com slash the MJcast. Hit up the MJcast.com slash shop. Help to support the MJ cast by looking at those two things, especially crack corn. That's, that's a really big thing. This is our first sponsorship, like I said, at the start of the show. And uh, it's really important if you want to see us launch into that professional podcast space and really continue this show at a high level, then uh, support us on with crack corn and, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, thank you, Kevin. And uh, again, thank mm-hmm. you for coming on the MJ cast and taking some time out and being with us. Thank you so very much, and and God bless you guys, and, and much love and much success.